What's up, everybody? Jay Miller here, back again with another Productivity in Tech podcast. Uh, this is the show where I sit down with someone in the tech space that is just doing things, uh, whether they're uh, building apps, helping keep apps alive, hosting conferences, you know, whatever it is they're doing, we want to talk about it. But I'm Jay Miller. As I said before, I am a digital media consultant, programmer, multi potentialite thing. Uh, basically a fancy way to say I write code, I do marketing, and I help developers do what they want. And I'm here today with someone that I have known for a few years now, uh, mostly through Twitter, but uh, we've been trying to get this conversation going for, wow, forever, probably since uh, the the revision of uh, the Pit podcast, the one, the only Jeff Triplett. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, it's it's good to to talk to you outside of like DMs, you know, match of voice. And <laughs> I, I think we'll see what we've had one phone conversation, one video chat and like at least 100 DMs. So, I mean, I, I can say we're Internet friends at least. Oh, for sure. I think we've each had a kid, <laughs> too, since it started. So. Wow. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, at, at the time of recording and I think actually the funny thing is we're going to release this. The day before, yeah, my daughter will be turning one the day before, the day after this is released. So it has definitely been uh, a journey. Yeah, my son will be two in the next like week or so as well. So oh, it sounds wow. like they're born right around the same dates and stuff. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, my wife did not let us name my daughter uh, Liberty since she was born on 9-11. I was like, it's either America freedom or liberty and she's like how about none of those and i was like all right fair enough i'll go <laughs> try <with> that. That. <laughs> i would have not have named my daughter any of those but that's okay no <laughs> no offense to anyone that did it's fine and i'm sure all of your friends in like the south are really no I'm, I'm sure will like will gan is probably like this this guy but uh why don't you tell everybody a little bit about uh what you do uh in the development space Sure. So I moved to Lawrence, Kansas, probably 11 years ago to work on Django and work for a, a newspaper that basically where Django was from. Um, since then, I've kind of stuck around. I watched Django kind of grow from this small little project that was just used for newspapers. And it's kind of grown into, you know, a, a large framework that is never going to be the wrong decision for using. Um, since then, I've worked on DjangoCon US the last five years as kind of a principal organizer. I help start a nonprofit who's responsible for making sure that the conference happens every year. Um, and that's called DEFNA, the Django Events Foundation North America. Um, I'm also a, a, a director on the Python Software Foundation, which is the Python language that you know a lot of people use, which is pretty neat. Um, I'm also a, uh, I work at Revolution Systems and I'm a partner and a consultant there. And so if you have a Django problem or, or like a Python program or a scaling issue, then that's kind of the stuff we like to do. So a lot of web stuff and a lot of backend engineering. You know, I this this is one of those questions that I guess I'm showing my Python non professionalism. I did not know that Django started as a as a tool for newspapers. Is that right? Yeah, it was actually born in the basement, like gosh, fifteen years ago, I think. Close to 15. So, yeah, a little newspaper. They were running PHP, and uh, a couple of the people that worked there, Simon Willison and uh, Adrian Halavati, and then later Jacob Kaplan Moss worked on it as an open source project, and they were open sourcing it. But they liked working on Python. And so, the, the story that I like to tell is while the bosses weren't paying attention to what was going on, they basically started writing Python code. So, before you know it, they had this framework. So, not the popular version of the story, but you know, that's that's how I was able to get into kind of this position that I'm in now where I'm doing a lot of uh, Python based automation to like scripting uh, at my day job and even in like pit as a business was just 
my boss was like, hey, get this thing done. And I was like, OK, I can do this the easy way or I can do this the hard way. So then I pulled out Python and I'll let you decide which one uh, the Python way was. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan. I, I originally started using it probably it was probably about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, and I was managing an ISP. And it kind of came down to if I needed to script something like create email accounts or create like FTP accounts for like uploading files because people used to do that at that time. Um, so it, I was using PHP for a while to script things and PHP really wasn't designed to do like server bash kind of stuff. It was nice for like generating websites and, you know, making pages work and contact pages and stuff like that. So if you're building a web seat, website, PHP is fine. It was really hard to make it do other things like run it from bash. And so that's when I first got exposed to Python. And uh, it really there was no turning back for me. I felt like I could write fewer lines of Python to get more done. The language was really readable. It was really, you know, I thought it was reusable. It was a really good ecosystem around like sharing code and being able to use other people's libraries. That's kind of what hooked me. You know, I can I can actually agree with you on that. And, you know, happy to announce. I think you already know this because, of course, when I found out, I had to tell somebody, um, you know, we we're talking about sharing code and, and like helping one another out in the community. Uh, the first conference I ever attended, first developer conference, North Bay Python 2017. Um, I sat there with like Trey Hunter and Melanie and and so many other people that are just like deep in the Python space and super helpful. And they helped me come up with this talk idea based around Pit. You know, how was I using Python in the podcast? How was I using it for the community space? And now how am I using it as, you know, a business owner? And, you know, happy to say that after two years, that talk finally got accepted somewhere. Uh, and it just happened to be North Bay Python 2019. So, uh, yeah, in a couple months, if anyone's in the Petaluma area, be on the lookout for that. I'll be giving my first conference talk. But I would not have been able to do that had it not been for, you know, those people sitting there at an Indian restaurant as we're like talking. And I'm trying to remember who else was there because uh, we had a couple of PSF members. I I want to say that uh, Carol was there as well. And... I mean, it, it was just so crazy. The first Python meetup I ever went to, Carol was the first person to talk to me. And it's like, in my mind, like, I have no idea who this person is. And then later on, someone goes, you know, she's like a director for the PSF, right? And I'm like, the PSF, is that like a video game company? Like, what, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've known Carol for a while. She actually was one of my big influencers as, as far as like, when I started looking at, like, do I want to try to take on this nonprofit for DjangoCon? Uh, basically, DjangoCon was kind of at this, like, impasse where it, it was, the, the language was doing well, the community itself with the conference was getting a little too expensive. And basically, people were just not going because tickets were too expensive. And there were kind of other, other things going on at the time. And so I kind of volunteered last minute to try to help it. And we, we, got, we got through that time. And so then... Uh, Russell Keith McGee, who is the, uh, the Django Software Foundation president at the time, had approached me and just said, hey, if this is something you would like to take on, you know, we would, we'd love to take the energy that you brought, you know, to this this year. And because that literally was like a week before replacement for a, a program chair to try to like help the conference go. But uh, at PyCon, Carol brought me aside and I really, she's kind of one of my mentors, even though we, we only get to talk a couple of times a year, but she kind of told me the things that I needed to hear at the right time, which was a big influence for me that maybe I had kind of the right beat at the time because you know the conference itself used to not be very inclusive or very diverse. And that's something in five years I felt like we've really made some you know amazing ground. I think the conference you were talking about too, North Bay Python, I think they've done a lot of great stuff too. And so I like seeing that in, in Python and the space and communities and you know as, as Python pushes the communities and the, the industry too then a lot of other conferences and, and communities too are growing. So I'm, I'm proud of that work we've done. And thanks to people like Carol and yourself. So thank you. Oh, thank you for uh, for representing the, the Python and Django community. And that's going to lead me to uh, probably the first question because uh, we've gone back and forth about this a few times. I love web frameworks. I do not get Django. Like it is just... <laughs> like, it is just not 
like I started with Flask and like I I've kind of gotten away from Flask too now and I've kind of made the decision to to invest in like static websites just because I don't really do that much that involves a constantly running server but I'm pulling up a uh, a DM that we had back in August of the earlier August of this year uh, when I launched Render Engine and I remember in the bio it said it's not too monolithic like Django. And your mm. your exact response is, congrats, Django's not a monolith. So <laughs> tell me why. Tell me like where Django's place is in the, the web industry. Because, I mean, the people who aren't into Python are going to say, oh, why don't you use, you know, Node or, or React or, you know, one of those tools. And then we have this weird onset of like .NET developers that are just like, oh, just use Blazor and or use .NET Framework and all this stuff. So, so where is Django in that? And tell me why it's not a monolith. Because when I, when people ask me what Python web frameworks I can go with, I can say, well, static. You want to go with something like, like Pelican. A um, lot of magic happening. Can't really explain it. If you want to go web frameworks on the light side, you go with like. Flask or Bottle, if you're not doing anything too crazy, and then if you want to build like this gigantic application, then you go with Django. But apparently that's not the case. So please explain to me uh, what Django's position is. Well, so first of all, use the tool that works for you. So what what framework works the best? Like you know, you, you're gonna set down the noodle on something. You got an hour. So what are you gonna use? <sighs> Yeah, I would need that whole hour just to, to make that decision. Like that's that's my problem. <laughs> well, I, I don't think any of the frameworks you used are a bad bad idea. Like it's it's using the tool that you know, use the tool that you like. There are things that I'll turn the flask for if I want something that is like I want a quick proof of concept. Uh, Starlight's another one that I like that's kind of new and it's an async framework. And to me it's just the fewest amount of lines of code I can write to try to get an application up just to do a demo. As soon as I want to start talking to a database, that's where I want Django's ORM, mostly because you get the admin for free. I do not want to write another line of admin code in my life. And Django immediately makes that possible. You can do this with Flask, and I'm sure there are like other, you know, there's applications you can install. I'm sure somebody's made an admin tool. Um, SQL Alchemy is a great ORM tool. Um, I have no problem with any of these tools. It's just, I don't want to figure them out. Django has really good docs. It's one place I can go. Um, I can ask people on Twitter and they'll point me in the right direction because I don't know everything. I, I've worked on it for 15 years, but I don't know everything about it. And I don't think anybody does. So I love the community, which is part of why I've stuck around it in Python. But, you know, something that, you, that was kind of... Con- I don't, okay, so something that I don't know why it's controversial, but we made the decision probably three years ago with the DjangoCon website to just use GitHub pages. And so GitHub pages are backed by Jekyll, which is built in Ruby. And so every year we usually get a couple of people that are like, you know, I can't believe that DjangoCon is hosted using you know Ruby and Jekyll. And so to me, it's like, what are we optimizing for? We're optimizing for people who, we get a lot of people who are brand new to tech and brand new to you know, the web industry. So they come in because of the community. They can go in their browser on GitHub. They can make a suggestion or add a blog post. They don't actually have to download anything. They don't have to worry about installing, you know, like SQLite, Postgres, MySQL, Nginx, Docker. They don't need to worry about any of that stuff. And they can just go in their browser. They can, you know, fork the project or propose, you know, create a pull request where this pull request has my blog post or my sponsor change or I found the typo on the website. They can send that to us. We can just look at that, approve it, put it on the website. We don't have to worry about the point. We don't have to worry about anything. So to me, like we decided to optimize, even though it wasn't Django, you know, for what worked best for you know the people and the organizers who, who were helping. And so to me, that's what I go for. So I do like static stuff. I don't really like the Python um, static generators so much just because I'm really lazy and I want to be able to do something that just works on GitHub. So to me, that's kind of a weird thing about Django. Like I wish Django had a better static story because I think that would be really neat to be able to take something from Django, push the GitHub, have my local copy and deal with that. For me though, since I have used Django for so long, 
Um, it, it's just really easy for me to develop bigger applications. I know how it scales. Uh, I've worked on websites before that were getting seven and a half million people an hour on it. It's really hard to scale with other things. And so I think Django kind of has the right parts and the right buttons that I know how to tune and configure to say like, I want to do caching and I know the site's going to be write heavy. So I can plug Redis in or memcached or if I need to use multiple MySQL sequences or Postgres boxes, you know, to try to like distribute writes, I can do that. If I need to use something like Celery, where I want to take all of my writes, push them in the background, run them on a couple of, you know, dozen servers if I need to. I've never needed that many for, for Celery. But I can push all the writes to the back background and the Celery tasks and stuff so that the front end is just free to say, cool, you submitted a bunch of stuff, we'll get back to you in a couple of seconds or 30 seconds and let you know that things have been completed. So I'm just a fan of using the tool that you like best. If you want to learn something new, I think you should like, you know, as a back-end person, I mostly do Python and Django. I don't do JavaScript as much, but like lately I've been playing with Tailwind CSS a lot, which I really love. And it's just a CSS framework. It's more like a developer wrote like a, a design framework CSS. It's like all the things designers have told me not to touch for like 15 years. <laughs> it's like, I just get to do it the way that made sense then but it works. And so, you know, I, I think you should, there's some, there's definitely some energy behind I'm wanting to create something new or learn something that I've never learned before. And I think that's really powerful. So I think if you are a Django person, I think you should go learn something that pushes your boundaries a little bit and then come back to Django and see what you learn. So. No, I, I like, I love that answer. I still can't figure out Django to save my life, but that's okay. Like, like you said, I think that, you know, for me, I've, I've tried to get away from having to have persistent data, having to, you know, have these applications that run on a heavy backend. And I know that like right now, the, the fancy word for that is like Jamstack, you know, like Netlify coined the term of, you know, a little bit of JavaScript, some type of, you know, application model that you don't really worry too much about. And then all of these little modules that you just add on using a single line of JavaScript code. Uh, it's it's not that I think that that's the way of the future, but uh, again, like you said, a lot of the things that people are building, I don't need to flex my Flask muscle for something that doesn't require Flask. You know, like you said, for, for the DjangoCon website, you don't necessarily need all of that. The overhead of running 15 servers and having, you know, load balancers on, on everything. And and what's even better is let GitHub worry about all that. You know, you can, yeah. they, you know, they that have people you who are on, people on call 24 seven. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. If the, if the Django Con website has a problem, you know, at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, it will be solved by the time we all wake up. So thank you, GitHub, for your hard work and free hosting. So perfect. So you mentioned a lot, you know, just even in explaining some of the capabilities that Django had. Uh, as you were saying, you know, a lot of the the different things you're you're throwing out a bunch of. I don't want to call them buzzwords because I mean I understood what they were. I had sure. just never thought about them in you know my whole web development experience, which is very little. But I, I wonder, how did you get to that point? Like, you know, you mentioned like just working in Django, you know, for a long time and, and being there, like, was that, was that enough to become proficient in Python or, or I guess even like, I mean, in the RevSys, you know, role that you're in now, like, I'm just going to connect to the community. Was that enough? Um, I, I think I've always had kind of strong opinions. I think, well, actually, when I first started, I think I had probably loosely held opinions about, you know, maybe it was like confidence too, of trying to figure out like, how do these things scale? And so when I worked at the Orange Journal World, uh, we, they basically created a new startup called Media for Media. And what they were doing was trying to host hundreds of newspapers for different newspapers across the US. So we were kind of in an interesting situation where we were hosting like three to 400 Django sites. So for us, when I say something like Celery, which basically is just a task queue, it, it takes a job, it runs it in the background. And so what we kind of learned to do pretty quickly was it didn't make sense if you've got 400 newspapers running on like three or four servers, 
it doesn't make sense to have like so many dedicated resources for every single newspaper that are just going to sit idle 90% of the time. So what we were trying to do is like figure out tools, test things out, fail quickly, try something else. And then we just kind of iterated on that. And I think I kind of saw like, I saw the period of time when people weren't using Get and Get seemed like the right tool pretty quickly. And so I felt pretty strong that I don't like everything about Get, you know, 15 years ago, but it's kind of getting the right, the right pieces in the right order. So actually that wasn't 15 years ago. I know that Get is even 15 years old now that I say that. But um, yeah, so, you know, feeling fast, um, not being able to, fry, not being afraid to try new sound kind of pieces of technology, uh, which you just kind of have to feel out. Like if somebody creates a new language and no one's ever heard of it before, I probably don't want to bet my startup on that. You know, but like a new web framework or something, if it's Python or Ruby, you can probably get in and change things around and you're going to be okay. That's why I don't really get too like married to a particular framework. And I tell you, like, use the best tool for the job, basically. But um, as far as like knowing Python, I like that I think Python originally, I think it was on like maybe 20 things in the language you really had to know. Like, once you kind of knew how to do loops and you knew how like if statements work and logic works and functions and classes, like, it's really not a hard language once you kind of break it down to those fundamentals to, to start with. So for me too, like also where I was going with the get stuff, testing, when I was started, it, testing wasn't a huge thing, but we very quickly realized like when you, when you push bad code out and it crashes like, you know, 300 newspaper websites, it's like, it's not a fun place to be. So testing for us was just a good way to like ensure that when I do a deployment at, you know, 12 o'clock at night, I'm going to get to sleep. And so otherwise, and there were times in Django's early days that a new version of Django would come out and we would deploy it and something would break. And so thankfully, some of the core devs were in Australia at the time and we could actually just like IRC them and say, hey, I, I think we broke something or I think that the, the ORM is consuming a lot of memory because the websites keep crashing because they're running out of memory. And someone would look and go, oh, yes, actually. And so they would patch something and we'd try it out and Three in the morning, we all go home because you know the memory was fixed. And so there were patches of Django that you can go back and it would say like accredited to Lawrence Journal World at the time, which you know, to me is a fun story now. But <laughs> at the time, I might have said use class too. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I definitely get that, and and that's something that you know I can't believe that I can say you know I started learning Python six years ago. And now it's like, I mean, I'm sure like, it's like sure young, young whippersnapper over here, just learning Python, <laughs> you know, that's, that's how I feel at times because, you know, we were talking yesterday, I know we're working on this transcription thing and, you know, I, I literally just have our DM thread up because I know like all of the great topics are just sitting in our DM somewhere. Uh, so it was like, oh yeah, so I've made the so I've made some changes to it, including setting up click to make the first step uh, you know a little bit more understandable. I've used click maybe twice. And before then, it wasn't arg parse that I was using. It was like, you know, import sys sys dot, dot arg, you know, and I would literally just be like throwing things into my, you know, the the buffer just like, okay, so at position one, it's this. At position two, it's this. And I had to like make notes for myself of what to put in there. And it's great that I, I've i used arc parse before, but these are things that I didn't need to learn for almost six years. But now I'm in a position to where learning them wasn't that hard. And I mean, even for someone who's only been working in Python for a few months, if I said, oh, yeah, just use Click. Look, here's the documentation. Take a look at it. It's If you have any questions, let me know. I'm confident that, you know, they would be able to do it. If, if they have, like you said, if you know the 10, 15 things, 10 or 15 basics of Python, you could, you could really just run with it. I mean, that's one of the things that I'm wanting to do with this Render Engine project is there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in Pelican and some of the other static site generators that's just 
obfuscated. The whole reason I made, I wanted to make Render Engine was because I was using Pelican and I was trying to figure out how to modify the RSS feeds so that I could turn them into podcast feeds. And I'm like digging through the code. I mean, I, I dug through the code for like a week and a half. And I was like, I cannot find where this stupid feed gets generated. I think I have an idea. I think it's right here, but I have no idea how I'm supposed to modify this to make it work. So I'm just not going to. I'm just going to build something that generates raw HTML using Jinja 2. And it was a lot easier than I thought it was. Now, of course, there are tons of bugs. Um, but even when I started hosting Pit the first time in Flask, there were tons of bugs. Ask me today why there are still like 4,000 requests a month for old RSS feeds for the Pit podcast. Like, I, yeah, I'll get to it. It's on my to-do list. But there are... It's so easy to at least get there, to at least start making steps in the right direction and even learning testing for the first time learning how to mock things in like PyTest is I still screw it up so many times. And if you like watch any YouTube videos, the first thing they always say is like mocking in Python is hard. Like unit, unit testing and knowing where to mock things is so hard. Knowing where to monkey patch things is so confusing at times. Let me try to break it down for you. Like there are 15 different videos that all start with that exact same phrasing. And and it is hard. It's yeah, it's it's a hard concept for people to get. And I messed it up a lot. And so we had a project a couple of weeks ago that I was needing to do some mocking on. And I'm working with a coworker and you know, she actually wrote some code. I'm like, I don't know what that does. And I've looked at Python for 15 plus years. Like I, I I still don't know what it does. It worked. And once I got into the code and could see it, and it's not super complex, it's just, oh, I, I didn't know this worked this way. You know? So mocking is kind of hard too. I don't know if your audience knows what mocking is, but basically you're kind of like providing a, you're providing like some fake functionality where if you're saying like, let's go get RSS off of your website, like you're trying to get like a feed for news. And so mocking kind of lets you say, let's just skip the steps and bring you back a copy of what I'm expecting to see. And that way you can just test against it because your test shouldn't test to see that, up, that your website is up that you're trying to release code for, which may not be up, which is why you're writing the test and why you're writing the code. But uh, one thing you said, too, that kind of stuck out to me, um, you're right, it is very powerful and freeing to be able to write your own framework and to write your own code to do stuff. For me, what I struggled with for many years, which is why I stopped blogging for a long time, is because I was chasing, I don't know that it was perfection, but there was a minimum amount of features that I thought I needed to have before I could blog. And so I finally just switched back to Jekyll just because it works well enough. And there are things that I absolutely don't like about it that I would love to see fit. But at least sometimes I would get in these rabbit holes just trying to write a blog that I would never get out of. And I'm like, why am I trying to create like Tumblr from my blog? It doesn't matter. Like this just keeps me from actually writing. And I just need something that I can write, meant to get, and not worry about my database provider, how I'm going to host it. Should I use Nginx for my web server or Apache or what am I going to do? You know? Well, and I think that's why... I, I do love static sites so much is because, you know, I, you know, you're, you're definitely right there. There is only so much that you really need to do to have a website up and running. And the less that you can get away with doing, in my opinion, the better, you know, that's, you know, like you said, the best, the best tool to use is the one that requires the least amount of code written or what's the, uh, the saying, like, the best code is the code not written or something and like that's, that. And that's a true point. Like a lot of times when I'm helping big clients scale, it, it's weird to them because I'm like, why are you doing this thing that you don't have to do? Like I've seen Jenga websites that had two, 300 servers. We've gotten down to eight. And that's because we put a CD in front of it and we've like optimized their homepage. Wow. So <laughs> you're not hitting 2000 database queries on your homepage because they probably shouldn't do that if you're expecting seven and a half million people to visit your website an hour. But you can scale static and do nothing almost infinitely, which is great. And it's cheaper. Like, would you rather run a CDN and pay very little? Or would you want to run 200 servers in Amazon to do that? So that's the kind of stuff I do. And you're absolutely right, though. The, the best way to scale is just to not do it. Definitely. Well, 
we're about to hit the the half hour mark so i'm gonna give my spiel and then i'm gonna have one more question for you um it's been fun talking to jeff and i'm gonna pick on him a little bit because the only time i get to talk to him is about every day in twitter but did you know we also have a slack channel and i know that jeff doesn't like joining slack channels i think actually i think i have that in a dm somewhere um that i might pull up later if he tries to to argue the <laughs> the response to that uh but we do like connecting with the people listening to the show and like i said pit is uh, i learned the phrase for this today it's called a renaissance business which means that we're all about doing things really because we can, because they're interesting, because we're enjoying doing it. So when I say that, like, if you have a podcast and you need help with editing or getting transcriptions done, we're not doing this to necessarily become millionaires off of it. Trust me, that, that this is not the way to do it. We're doing it because we actually care about the podcasting industry. We care about the development space as a whole. There's a reason Pitt works with developers and tech folks only. Like you're not gonna see me like at Coca-Cola's offices trying to show them how to do a podcast. But what you will see me is working with people like Developer on Fire, the .NET Core Show, and uh, probably the biggest name in there, uh, Talk Python to me. Um, these are all clients of Productivity in Tech who trust us to get their content looking all spiffy and sharp. And if you want to be with them, then you got to go through me. Go to productivityintech.com. Sign up for the newsletter. I share productivity tips. I share development tricks. I think in the last newsletter, I, I told a story about what it was like to be a, a super awesome Marine and wishing that I was the Marine that no one could remember their name because those are the people that had an easier time in boot camp, but yet they still got all the same benefits. So... If any of that sounds interesting to you, go to productivityintech.com, sign up for the newsletter, and uh, yeah, hope to chat with you as well. But I have one more question for you before we jump into the after show, Jeff. So you've been you've been in this industry for over a decade now. Not to not to pick on you. I know it sounds like a long time. I'm, I'm... I've, I've seen things. That's <laughs> You saw Python 3.3. Three. <laughs> five, two, four, oh, yeah. wow. Oh, oh, I don't even want to talk about 2020 is approaching friends. <laughs> but the question that I have for you is, has the industry changed that much in regards to breaking into the Python industry? You know, I've, I've been friends with, with you and with people like Trey Hunter and, and Kenneth Love, and I think all of them, except for Trey, for some reason, even though he's the only one that lives in the same city as I do, um, have been on the podcast now. Uh, but all of you have been able to get into the industry. And I'm sitting here six years later being 100% community taught, not self-taught, because I can't teach myself anything. I have applied to many different development roles whether they were junior developer roles, which I was told I was overqualified for, uh, mid-level and senior level roles, which I was told I was underqualified for. I don't know how that works. Um, internships, which I was literally told, hey, look, here's an actual job, apply to it. And then when I applied to it, they say, oh, I, we think you're not qualified for this role. Uh, I, I personally feel like the tech industry is a little biased towards non-traditional applicants and obviously given that explanation it would kind of make sense i'm a non-traditional applicant i'm a college dropout you know I, i'm a veteran uh i don't have any kind of formal training in the tech space but i hear about all these stories of people who who are able to break in and become a you know a developer advocate for you know some fortune 500 company or you know, basically work remote and, and enjoy what they're doing in the Python space. Um, are these like the unicorn stories and you still kind of need to go the traditional route for the most part, you know, from what you see, or, or is it really changing? It's hard. It's really hard. And I, I think that that's a good thing to talk about because I don't think a lot of people bring it up. Um, 
I, I, I don't see magic for people. I, I think that there's definitely, you know, we're still in an era where people want rock stars. We're still in the, the era where people want more experience than some of these technologies have been around. They want 10 X so, developers. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's absurd that you have to have a conversation with people about why that isn't, why that's not cool. And people will argue on Twitter because that's what people do on Twitter basically. But, but yeah, people will basically argue that, you know, like, well, there's, there's one percent of value to this, so I'm going to keep saying it. Where it's like that's kind of toxic, and so I think as people learn, I think it's going to get easier. But I, I do notice, and I don't want to say I'm biased towards the area that you live in, but I do think it's harder there, and I think it's harder, especially like San Francisco area, because I hear lots of horror stories every day of most of people, and so I do know a lot of people who you don't see in three or four years it takes them to get the job and the persistence and stuff, and there's a lot of people that give up. And so um, I like to think that over the long run, it works out for people, but that's just not always the case. So I, I, I don't know. Like, I, there's a lot of people you could bring on your show that would be really good to talk about this because probably like five years ago when I started doing DjangoCon in Austin, uh, we had a couple of people who just literally quit their day jobs, jumped feet first in, and it took them a couple of years to find tech jobs. And I, I would tell anybody listening who's thinking of doing that right now, don't. Like take care of yourself first, just like the whole airplane rule of put your oxygen mask on, make sure you're taken care of, you know, because like you shouldn't have to think about, should I get heart meds or should I, you know, be able to afford to eat something other than ramen noodles? Because it's probably not healthy. Like when you're in college, you can get away with that stuff. But once you're out of college, you shouldn't just try to eat ramen noodles and survive. So I'm, I so, mean, yes, I had I think- noodles for dinner tonight. So <laughs> But if you eat it every day, every meal, then sorry. Yeah. It was more because I, I had a podcast to, to jump onto, so I need to eat something quick. It wasn't necessarily because that's all I could get. So I, I definitely think you can make it, and a lot of people do it. But I, I think finding the backstories of people, and you know, once we're off the show, I'm happy to like give you some names of people to interview and talk about because you know it, it is a thing, and I do hear from people who are frustrated. And so I think people like myself, once you're in the industry, um, and you see job applicants, like if you follow me on Twitter, I'm web, at Webology. Um, I give people crap about it all the time. And I try to call out bad behavior when it comes to applications and stuff. And I try to promote underrepresented people to try to help them get jobs and stuff. Because I think it does help when someone like myself, who's been in the industry for a while, or people, some people in a very small amount of Python and Django know. Um, I think that just helps. And it costs me nothing to do it. And I feel like more people should do that because, you know, when you can take your, your privilege and help somebody else, then why be doing this stuff and why be in tech and why, why wouldn't you want to help people is kind of how I feel. No, I absolutely agree. And, and you dropped your, uh, your Twitter handle there, but uh, if, if people want to get in touch with you a little bit more, whether it's to talk about the weird hiring disparity in tech or, or anything, I, I'm, I'm telling you, this good is this guy is really good on Twitter. Like he will respond, uh, and then you'll have a conversation for years, and then eventually he'll jump on your podcast. So, uh, if Dave's nice way of saying it, I never shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, I think if anything, like I'm I'm looking at this history. I definitely talk more than you. Uh, I think this podcast has shown that too. So, uh, if people do want to get your your advice or your or just even connect with you, how how could they do that? Uh, webology on Twitter is a good place. Uh, my DMs are semi open. Um, also, I guess apparently the, I, I guess your Slack channel. <laughs> I didn't know you had a Slack. So, <laughs> okay, hold on. D- that is so not true. <laughs> I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna send it to you. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, we have a, we have a Slack group in there. Uh, there's some Python folks in there. Jason Brechen, uh, Bre- uh, I don't know if it's Brechen or Brecken. Jason, you're a premium member. I'm sorry. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. But uh, but yeah, Jeff, thank you for coming on to the show. We've got an after show to get to, uh, which if you want to know about the after show, again, productivityintech.com. That, however, is reserved just for the premium members, the people who uh, say, you know what? Supporting productivity in tech is worth the two coffees a month that you have to give up to do it ten dollars a month or a hundred dollars a year it gets you access to the behind the scenes of what pit is like as a business i can tell you now pit wouldn't be where it is today if it weren't for the people who have been supporting the show some of them have been supporting for 
several years, and I have to thank them, but I'm not going to do them by name because they'll get mad at me and be like, oh, you don't have to do that, bro, and I'm like, whatever. Um, but I do have to thank Nadira Mawali for the use of his intro, uh, music, a hustler in spite of myself for the intro and outro music, and I do have to thank Icon Pro Audio for the generous donation of audio equipment to make this show sound nice and sharp. But that's going to do it for the podcast, for myself, for Jeff. I am Jay Miller. Hope we've been productive. And now on to the after show.